We ask, Lord, that you would just touch our hearts, Father, that you would speak to us, Father. A lot of things are happening in the world that we live in today. And God, I think you are speaking to our hearts in a lot of different ways, and we pray that we listen to your, what you say, God. That as we read your word and hear your word, God, those truths that need to resonate with us, God, we trust that they will through the power of the Holy Spirit. And I pray if there's anybody here who's never asked Jesus Christ to be their Lord and Savior, that you would do that this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, the name of the study is called, And the Sign Said. And so that's the name of the study. We're going to be in Acts chapter 13. So open your Bible to Acts chapter 13. We're going to be picking it up in verse 46. I'd like to pop the map up and let us know where we are in the book of Acts. We're actually on Paul's first missionary journey. Him and Barnabas have taken off. They've actually left Antioch, the church in Pisidia in Antioch. They went to Seleucia, and they took a boat over to Salamis, the island of Cyprus at this time. And then from Salamis, they went across, all the way across the island, over to Paphos. They took a boat went up to Perga and Pamphylia, and now they're actually up in Antioch in the area known as Galatia. And today, we're going to go from Antioch, we're going to go to Iconium, and if we have time, we'll go to Lystra, and we'll see where we are, and then we'll continue on to Derbe, all in uh, Galatia at this time. But I do want to share verse 14 of, of Acts chapter 13 states, when they came to Antioch of Pisidia, Paul and Barnabas went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and they were invited to share. So in chapter 13, we are in Antioch, and Paul is speaking to this Jewish audience. We will, as we'll share before, when Paul would go into the city, if there was a synagogue, the first place that Paul and Barnabas would go is they would go to the synagogue, and he would have an opportunity, as we saw last week, to share from the Old Testament different words. And it was pretty easy because he has an opportunity. These people believe in God. They believe in the Old Testament. They believe it's God's inspired scripture. And because of that, he can take them and show them that Jesus is the promised Messiah declared by their own scriptures. And that's what he did in Antioch. We read that in verse 38 of chapter 13. Paul actually says, let it be known to you, brethren, that through this man is preached to you the forgiveness of sins. Amen. And by him, everyone who believes is justified from all things from which you couldn't even be justified by the law of Moses. Everyone, both the Jew and the Gentile, is justified by faith, by just believing. Everybody's sins were forgiven by faith. By what? Just believing. See, these missionaries, Paul and Barnabas, are proclaiming something new, and it is good news. It was glad tidings, and they wanted to hear more about God's incredible word. So we read in verses 42 through 44, when the Jews went out of the synagogues, the Gentiles prayed, begged, they begged that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath, a week later, the following Saturday. Now, when the congregation had broken up, many of the Jews and the devout proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. You see both Jews and Gentiles that are now following Christ, following the Lord, are now walking with him, and he's encouraging them to continue in the grace of God, and they wanted to hear more about the good news. Well, that good news travels fast. See, everybody went home. They started inviting their friends to church. They started saying, we heard some good news this last Saturday. Come and join us this Saturday, this Sabbath. And so verse 44 picks up. And it says, on the next Sabbath, almost the whole city came together together to hear the word of God. Wouldn't that be incredible? 
here we are. If everybody left Sunday and went home and said, there is some good news that's being spoken of at Calvary Chapel coming out, and we had the incredible problem as 6,000 people try to come into our church here that holds a couple hundred. What an incredible situation that. But how exciting that must have been. But watch what happens here in verse 45. Along with this incredible turnout, it says, but when the Jews saw the multitude, they were filled with envy. And now contradicting and blaspheming these guys, they opposed the things spoken of by Paul. I think it's very interesting that many of these Jewish people that were looking forward to hearing Paul the very next Saturday start contradicting him and opposing him. Why the change? Why would a person all of a sudden change in one week? Well, the answer is given it to us. It says that they were filled with envy. You see, the multitude was no longer coming to the Jewish leadership. They were now coming to hear Paul and Barnabas. Guys, envy is wanting or coveting what someone else has. Envy is wanting or coveting what someone else has. You see they have it, and you want to have that for yourself. What it actually means is you're not content with what God has given to you. These Jews wanted the popularity. They wanted the notoriety, the attention that was given to Paul and Barnabas. They were more concerned about their fame than actually pointing people to this true and living God. You see, sin, the, excuse me, envy is that sin that doesn't allow you to rejoice with those who rejoice. God says we should rejoice with those who rejoice. But you know, if you've been trying to have a baby and you haven't had a child, and then you see someone gets a child, you kind of go, oh, ah, but God wants you to what? Rejoice with those who rejoice. I want to have a job like you. I want to have a car like you. I want to have a, a, a family like you, a relationship like you, a vacation like you, a home like you. And it really is telling God that you're not content with where you are. You're not content with what he has provided you. You know, it says in 1 Timothy 6.6, 6, now godliness with contentment is great gain. That is an incredible life scripture. I want you to consider that. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Living a life following the Lord, serving him, being godly, and then secondly, being content with where he has me, knowing he's in control. God's word says is the greatest gain you can have. That we shouldn't be envious. See, the sin, the sin of envy, many times, not only are you not able to rejoice with those who rejoice, but many times you can actually start resenting and attacking the very people that you're envious of. You can be very cynical towards those people, very sarcastic towards those people. And that's what we see here. As the whole city comes out now to hear the good news, these people are filled with envy. And they try to discredit Paul and Barnabas by contradicting and blaspheming the very things that they saw. It says in verse 46, Then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first. That's the Jewish people. And judge yourself unworthy of everlasting life. Behold, we turn to the Gentiles. It's interesting that with all this contradiction and opposition, many people might become afraid. They might grow weary in well-doing, but instead they grew confident in their boldness. The word grew bold means to show assurance. They waxed bold. They were strong. They wouldn't let this challenge go unanswered. And why? Because they had the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit in their lives. We need to remember that back in 
in Acts 1.8, it says that you shall receive the power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and with that power of the Holy Spirit coming upon you, you shall be my witness. You shall be witnesses of me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the othermost parts of the world. And that's what they're doing. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. It came upon their lives. They were filled, they were called, they were sent, they were led, and now they are empowered by the very Holy Spirit to proclaim Jesus Christ to these people. And I want us to realize that so often we can say, well, that's Paul and that's Barney. Well, that's us, that's you, that's me. See, we too are filled with the Holy Spirit. We too are called of God. God also wants to send us out and to empower us with the same Holy Spirit, with that spirit of boldness to proclaim Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world. Paul said in Romans 1.16, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know why? Because that gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And so you know what we see? We see Paul going to the Jew first, and now also what? To the Greek. He's following the exact same pattern that he shares here in Romans. And so he brought the gospel to the Jew first, but now being rejected, he now turns to the Gentiles. And we're going to see this being a pattern. He will go to the synagogue first, and then he will share, and then he's being rejected, he will go to the Gentiles. It says in verse 47, For so the Lord has commanded us, I have sent you, as a light to the Gentiles, that you should be for salvation to the ends of the earth. And now we see them going. They're going through the Roman Empire to the ends of the earth. And it says in verse 48, and when the Gentiles heard this, woo, they were glad and they glorified the word of the Lord. And as many had been appointed to eternal life, believed. The Gentiles rejoice. They glorify God when they heard the word of God given through Paul. That salvation through Jesus Christ was made available not just to the Jewish people, but to the Gentiles. And the Gentiles had, didn't have to become a Jew to be saved just by believing in Jesus Christ. But do notice it says here that the, God's word was glorified, not Paul. It says, um, and they glorified the word of the Lord. I like that. I like that. The word of God was given the elevation, not Paul. These guys were, were envious because they thought Paul was being elevated, but the truth was God's word was being elevated, and that was the good news. The, these Jewish leaders also had the good news. They just didn't want to proclaim it and point people to Jesus Christ. Their eyes have glazed over. I remember Pastor Bob used to share, you know, share with people until their what eyes, what? glaze over, and then move on because the soil of the heart is hard. And I say, well, that's always true, except for police officers. When their eyes glaze over, I just think they've had too many donuts. No, I'm, I'm just, just joking there. I'm sorry. But when the, when the eyes glaze over, move on. Move on to more fertile soil. You got to realize God's in charge of the heart. He's got a plow. He's got a chisel. He's got some TNT. God will work on the heart of your family members, your friends, those people you've been sharing with. And Paul showed wisdom on not just staying there and spending time to persuade these hardened hearts, guys. When rejection comes, move on. And that's what he's going to do. But listen carefully. Keep praying. Keep praying, and we're going to see Paul's going to circle back again to these people at Antioch. Sometimes we see people reject it. You know what? Don't give up. Keep praying and circle back, because God will continue to work on their heart. That's what he loves to do. See, Paul, even, even as the Gentiles now are becoming the this focus, Paul still had a love for the Jewish people. He shared that in Romans 10. It says in Romans 10, one brethren, my heart's desire in prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. He has such a heart for the people of Israel that years later when he wrote to the Romans, his, his desire and his prayer is that the people of Israel would be saved. And it says in verse 49, and the word of the Lord was being spread throughout all that 
region. I think it's pretty remarkable that within a week, within one Sabbath to the other Sabbath, a church was born. What an incredible response. However, there was some hostility and there was some receptivity and the people that were receptive took God's word and started sharing it and now God's word was being spread. The word of the Lord throughout all that reason, region. But look at verse 50. But the Antioch Jews, the Jews that were in Antioch, they now stirred up the devout and the prominent women and the chief men of the city. Woo, they got the who's who in the city. They raised up persecution against Paul and Barnabas, and they expelled them from their town. This is not the first time, nor it will be the last time that we see the leadership of the Jews are going to misunderstand the message of salvation. They're going to misunderstand Paul's love for the Jewish people. And instead of receiving the good news, they start involving the power brokers of the town, these devout and prominent women, the chief men of the city. Now they're being influenced by the Jewish people. Look what Paul's doing. And now they started coming against him and realize when ground is being taken for God's kingdom, guys, always realize that's not bad news. See, opposition is going to come. Expect it to come. If you're not doing anything for the Lord, then Satan's going to just throw up his hand and say, oh, you're doing a great job. But when you start taking ground for the Lord Jesus, opposition is going to come. And that's what we see. We see opposition now occurring. We see opposition now, now coming to the people here. And, per, and now persecution and expulsion from the region occurs. But it didn't discourage Paul and Barnabas. It says in 51, and they shook off the dust off their feet. They actually just knock the dust off their feet against them, and they came to Iconium. See, in biblical times, when, when leaving the Gentile cities, the Jewish people would often go and knock the dust off their feet. They're saying, I want to separate ourselves from the beliefs of these Gentiles, from the custom of the Gentiles. We don't want to take anything away from us, from this Gentile city, not even the dust. And so Paul and Barnabas are doing the same thing, but they're making a declaration that they are separating themselves from the Jews who have rejected the Messiah. They're making a wrong choice. We don't want to take anything away from us from this Christ-rejecting Jewish people. And so often, when we get kicked out of one city, we want to stop. When we get knocked down, we want to stop, but that's not what happened. It says in verse 52, and the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. See, being filled with joy and the Holy Spirit go hand in hand because the fruit of the Spirit is joy. It's that, it's that emotion in our lives that comes from a complete trust that God is in control. It's not based upon circumstances or things that happen in our lives. It says in James 1, 2, to count it all joy, my brethren, when you fall into various trials and temptations. How can you count it all joy? How can you have joy in trials and problems and situations? It says in verse 3 of James 1, knowing that the trying or the testing of your faith produces patience. You see, God is on the throne, and God knows what we need to grow in him. God knows that, that we need patience, and so he brings situations and trials because the trying of our faith produces patience. Our faith that he's in control, our faith that he's on the throne, our faith that he knows what he's doing. We're in, we're in difficult times right now with this COVID-19. You guys aren't here. I have an empty church. And it can, get, it can get despairing. It can be difficult. It can be hard. Some of you guys are by yourself in your own apartment. And it's difficult. You don't have a place to go. You're with your kids. There are no kids. You're lonely and it's hard. Count it all joy. But that joy is a fruit of the Spirit of God within our lives. I want to encourage you to do that. See, we too can count it all joy. The Iconium, Jew, the Iconium Jews didn't receive the message, and so they get kicked out of town. I mean, the Antioch Jews. And so we read here, that now it happened in Iconium that they went together to the synagogue of the Jews and they spoke with a great multitude, both of the Jews 
and the Greeks believed. So look at the map, and I want you to see how close these two cities are. They're not very far apart. They went from Antioch now over to Iconium. I think that's about 100 miles away. And so now they are there, and they now do what? They go into another synagogue. And they speak with a great multitude, both Jews and Greeks now believe. You think that they just got ran out of the city by these Jews. Why go to another synagogue? Because they knew they had an open door of sharing. Wherever there were at least 10 Jewish men, there would be a synagogue. If there wasn't a synagogue, that means there wasn't at least 10 Jewish men in the city. And so they start their evangelical efforts always at a synagogue. And that would be the same thing. He would share with them. He would expound about them. He's already two steps ahead. He could just start going right into the scriptures, and they would believe the authority and share Jesus Christ with them. And so once again, he does that. And this time, he connects with them, and they believe. The Jews and the Greeks believe. I just think it's wonderful. It says in Romans 10, 12, and 13, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Have you called upon the name of the Lord this morning? Have you said, Lord Jesus, I, I call upon you to save me from my sins, to save me from the consequences of my sins, from etern save me from eternal damnation? from the guilt of my sin, from the power of sin over my life. God, I want to be relieved from this power, of this addiction that I have in my life of sin. Jesus Christ will do that. Jesus Christ can fill your life if you believe in him and trust in him. This salvation is in Jesus. We appropriate to our life only by belief in him. And it says in verse 2, but these unbelieving Jews now here in Iconium, they now stir up the Gentiles and poison their minds against the brethren. Wow. I'm sure not everybody in your life, once you got saved, were all excited. I know in my life, not everybody in my friends and family rejoiced with me when I declared that Jesus Christ was my Savior. And here we see that as people come to the Lord, not everybody in Iconium is rejoicing, just like they didn't rejoice in Antioch. And here we go again. The problem that we saw with the Antioch Jews was that was envy. Well, now we see in their situation, rather than using that for Satan to attack, he's now going to use the Gentiles this time. The Jewish people really didn't care for the Gentiles. They were the enemies. They were the lower class people. They weren't good for a whole lot. <clears throat> but the problem is they had a common enemy, and that was these people, Paul and Barnabas. And so they followed the the ancient proverb that suggests that two enemies can work together against a common enemy. The enemy of my enemy is my what? Friend. And so they befriended these Gentiles with one desire to destroy and get rid of Paul and Barnabas. And so what happens, they start controlling these Gentiles. They start poisoning their minds. They start making these false statements and lies. They start declaring fake news to them. And with that, their minds become poison. The word poison actually means to be afflicted, to be harm, to render evilly effective. And that's what they will do. See, Jesus warned us about the time when the Jewish leaders would actually work against the people from coming into the kingdom of God. In Matthew 23, 13, it says, but woe to you, this is Jesus' words, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For you neither go in yourselves, and look this, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. They're stopping someone from entering the kingdom of God. That's terrible. And so they were having this harmful effect on these Gentiles. And they started not only not going in, but coming against them. <clears throat> the last time they left the city, they didn't stay in Iconium. But look what happens here in verse 3. Therefore, they stayed there a long time, boldly speaking boldly in the Lord, <clears throat> who was bearing witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hand. It says this time, rather than leaving, they stayed there a long time. We're not too sure how long. But 
They felt that it was important for them to stay and to ground this Christian church, these Christian people, in the Word of God. You know, that takes courage to do the right thing in the midst of adversity. That's what courage is, is strength in the face of opposition, to hang in there when it's not easy to do. They knew that these young Chris's needed, Christians needed time to mature in their faith with the Lord. So many times we see a church might go and they, have, they start church planning and church planning and they set something up and they leave and they leave. They don't take the time to feed the sheep. They don't take the time to grow the flock of God that they have set up. And one of the distinctives of Calvary Chapel is that many times when a church is established, the pastor will stay with that flock and help them grow in the Lord. They don't go from church to church to church, denomination to denomination. Hey, this guy's doing a really good job. Let's move him to a larger church. That's what a lot of denominations do. But rather, they invest their time and their energy, they settle in the community, and they grow the flock that God has given them. 1 Peter 5, 1, 4 says, The elders who are among you I exhort, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the suffering of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed, listen to what he says, shepherd the flock of God which is among you. Isn't that great? Feed them, shepherd them, tend them, take care of them, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, not as being lording over them, those who entrusted in you, but as an example to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. And that's our desire at Calvary. Our desire is that we grow you in the word of God. Our desire is that we don't try to coerce you to something or, or lord something over you, but we grow you <clears throat> as one accountable to Jesus Christ, who is the chief shepherd. And so we see that despite the opposition, Paul and Barnabas continue to speak boldly in the Lord. And so what does the Lord do? Check this out. So the Lord was bearing witness to the word of his grace as they're sharing the word of God. By how? Well, God was granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But the multitude of the city was divided, part sided with the Jews and part with the apostles. You see, a division occurs. Some people are aligning with the apostles. Some people are aligning with the Jewish people that are opposing Paul and Barnabas. So God intervenes. One of the ways that God intervenes <clears throat> is by confirming the truth of what's being declared by signs and wonders. You might say, so what is a sign? What is a wonder? Well, a sign, like a lot of signs that we have in our world, they direct us and they tell us what to do, where to go. A sign is something that might lead you to some place or make you aware that something happens, or give us a warning. Turn right, turn left. 100 miles away, you'll be in Sacramento. Hey, you just passed a store, whatever it might be. They give you some direction. And the thinking person would look at the sign, and it would help them to the proper destination. Well, that's true about signs by God. See, a sign given is some supernatural, some intervention by God, some miracle that might occur. And if a person was to look at the miracle from God, the supernatural thing that they see, they would be influenced and directed. They would stop and say, wow, what is it that God wants me to do? And so you might have a supernatural thing, and maybe that's something that might happen in your life. might be a sign that says stop. Stop what you're doing. And God might be telling you to stop trusting in yourself, to stop leaning on your own understanding, to stop thinking that you're right made in your own eyes. I'm not too sure what God might be doing in your life. But anytime things supernaturally happens and we kind of go, wow, did you just see that? And a lot of time God is trying to give us and to speak truth into our lives. And you know what happens? A lot of times it causes us to wonder. And therefore signs cause us to wonder. Something God does in our lives makes us stop. It pauses us. And we might wonder, what is life all about? What is truth all about? What is eternity all about? What is heaven all about? See, it's easy to be so focused on the natural that you forget that God is in control, that God wants to intervene within our lives. We're consumed by the temporal that we are constantly looking down. We're never looking up. 
And so God does something. He does some sign, some miracle, some supernatural thing in our lives that makes us stop and makes us start wondering, directing about what really is important in our lives. See, God's never afraid to speak to you. He's never afraid to speak to a speaking person, I mean to a thinking person. And so some supernatural sign, some miracle will come into our lives. I think about the COVID-19. I think about we have this worldwide pandemic that's occurring that has affected this entire planet. Is that an intervention? Is that a sign? Is that something that God is allowing in our lives? Maybe he might be telling you not to hold on to things too lightly. Maybe he might be telling you that Christ's return for his church is just around the corner. Maybe it's a yield sign. Maybe God's telling you to slow down. Keep your eyes on him. Yield your life completely to God. Maybe you haven't done that. I'm not too sure what he might be speaking into your life. But I do know that God is still on the throne, that he still is in control. And things happen in our lives to get our attention to make us wonder, what is life all about? What is heaven all about? What is eternity all about? I think the problem is, is people think too little. I think people are believe whatever they are told to believe. And we just line up and we just move on through. Well, I guess, I guess this is just because of this. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's something else. Here it says, the Lord was bearing witness to the word of his grace by signs and by wonders. God granted signs and wonders to be done by the hand of Paul and Barnabas as evidence, as evidence of what was being shared by them. Signs and wonders do not precede God's word here or in the New Testament, but rather signs and wonders confirm the truth of God's word that had been declared. And so they declared boldly God's word, and then he confirmed it with signs and wonders to these people. And it says in verse 5, and then a violent attempt was made by the Jews and the Gentiles, by the Gentiles and the Jews, with their rulers to abuse and to kill them, to stone them. And they became aware of it, and they fled now to Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lyconia, and to the surrounding regions. And they were preaching the gospel here. <clears throat> so now the threats were going from words and threats to life-threatening violence, abuse, and stoning. And so they take off the 20 miles away to the town of Lystra. The perseverance in Iconian didn't mean that they have to be martyrs. Jesus actually said in Matthew 10, 23, when they persecute you in this city, flee to another city. That doesn't mean you're a coward. We saw not, no cowardness. We saw wisdom here. They stayed as long as they could despite the opposition, and they left only when it was necessary. And when they arrived at Lystra, it says in verse 7, <clears throat> and they were now preaching the gospel there. So now they're in Lystra, and they're declaring the truth. <clears throat> and in Lystra, a certain man without strength in his feet was sitting, a cripple from his mother's womb who had never walked. And this man heard Paul speaking, observing him intently, and seeing that he had faith to be healed, he then said in a loud voice, this is Paul, stand up straight on your feet, and he leaped and he walked. He leaped and he walked. Now, I want you to notice something here that is not obvious. They're going to Lystra, and where did they not go to? They didn't go into a synagogue. We went to, they went to Salamis, they went into a synagogue. They went to Antioch, they went into a synagogue. They went to Iconium, they went into a synagogue. They went to Lystra, ah! There must not have not been 10 Jewish men there. So there wasn't a synagogue. So he now was on the street and he's preaching on the street. And he starts sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with these people. It says that he actually declares the gospel there, verse 7. He's preaching the word of God. He's declaring the gospel to these people. And what do we say? That God can use signs and wonders as evidence for the word of God that was just shared. And that's exactly what happens here. It says we read that the man was, uh, heard Paul speaking. 
There was something that was evident about this man's faith. We're not too sure. It says, Paul observing him intently. Paul must have given some word of knowledge, some word of wisdom, a word of faith that this man was to be healed. The Spirit of God spoke to Paul's heart that this man had faith to be healed. And so Paul said with a loud voice, stand up straight on your feet. He makes a declaration. He tells this man to do something that was impossible to do. He told him to do something he had never done before, to stand up straight on your feet. Now, this guy had one of two choices. He could sit there and go, I don't know what you're talking about, man. That doesn't make any sense. Or he can believe the word of faith, and he can stand up and walk. I think many times, and we've talked about this before, that God declares a word of faith into our life. That God declares a truth into our life. And rather than believe in that truth, we look at ourselves, we look at our inadequacies, our inabilities. I got broken legs. I've been this way since my birth. I don't have that ability. He does. She does. But not me. And we don't appropriate God's word of faith in our lives and stand up and walk. We spend more time arguing with God of why we should do this thing rather than doing what this man does and standing up. We tell him all the reasons why we can't do something versus just standing up and believing. And I encourage you, the next time God declares to you, listen carefully, a word of faith, that you would believe it, that you wouldn't say, well, I can't. If God's telling you to do something, then do it. I remember one person said, you know, I, and it's always kind of stuck with me, just the whole aspect. If God tells you to go and visit a person, then get on the first plane and go. If you can't afford a plane, then get on a train and go. If you can't afford a train, then get on a bus and go. If you can't go, then, then start walking. If you can't walk, fall in the direction that God's telling you to go. Do whatever you can to do, but believe what he's told you to do and get moving. Be strong. Go forth, be obedient. And so we see this miracle, this sign again occurs within their life of this man every single time. And you know what the sign is saying? I think the sign had a different aspect. I think the sign was, you know what? Turn 180 degrees. Repent from the area you're going. I think the sign may have said, you turn, Y-O-U. You turn to me, is what he might be saying, as these men are watching this miracle in their lives. He might be sharing the other thing. There's one way to salvation. You think you know the way of salvation, but through this miracle that we're seeing, it's a sign that you would wonder, is this the right way? You just proclaim Jesus Christ. Maybe he is the way, the one way for life and for salvation. I think it's interesting that we all have a decision, we all have a choice of what we're going to do in our lives. We all have a choice of when we see a situation and things happening, are we going to turn to the Lord? Are we going to repent? Are we going to do the work? We're going to stop here this morning. And I just pray that, that when we are being used by the Lord, that we would believe what he says. We'd, we'd stand up and we'd do what God would want us to do. I pray that we'd check our heart that envy isn't there. We do those things within our life to allow God to work in every aspect of our life. So I just encourage you this morning that you keep your eyes focused on the Lord. Allow him to work strongly. What is the Lord speaking to your heart right now during this time that you are sequestered? What is the Lord speaking to you? Was it to go call some people? Is it to, to grow closer unto him? I don't know what God's speaking to your heart, but pray and ask God to speak to you. Pray that he would give you joy in the midst of the trials and tribulation. Pray that you would be godly and be contented at the same time, because godly with, godliness with contentment is great gain. But most of all, keep your eyes focused on God. He's the author. He's the finisher of your faith. And if you've never received Jesus Christ, I want to give you an opportunity right now. Let's pray. Father, we just come to you, Lord, and we just ask God that we thank you for your word, the goodness of your word. I pray if there's anyone here who's never said, Lord Jesus, come into my life, they do that right now. Just pray with me, Lord Jesus. 
forgive me of my sins. I believe that your death on the cross was sufficient enough to take away my sins, and I believe in that. I receive that into my life. God, I declare you as my Lord and Savior. I confess it with my mouth, and I believe it in my heart. Thank you. If you've done that, you're saved. I want to pray for the rest of us, those of us that know the Lord, that have a walk with God. Father, fill us with your Spirit. Give us that boldness through the power of the Spirit to proclaim the truth to our friends, to our family, to the people we come up with. Give us that love that Paul had, the love for his brethren, that they would be saved. Help us be willing to loop around, come back around to the friends that didn't receive it. Maybe, God, you've loosened up that soil. We throw more seeds. We start watering. God, let us use that opportunity for you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a great rest of the day, and happy Mama's Day.